Earnings season is right around the corner. Just how bad is this bloodbath going to be? You're in the right place, folks, because this is where the money is. David, we've got earnings season coming up, and the banks are going to be among the first companies that are going to be reporting. We've got J.P. Morgan and Wells Fargo early on in, mm -hmm. in the earnings season. What are you looking for out of, out of the big four bank earnings? I'll start it with Wells Fargo. You mentioned the bloodbath. Maybe there's going to be a bloodbath in the banking sector, maybe. But if there's a bank that I'm not necessarily too worried about, I'm not going to be itching to be like, oh my gosh, what was their earnings for, for the second quarter? It's Wells Fargo. I mean, they've had nine or 13 straight quarters of earnings growth. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've been a model of con consistency here. And the big question around Wells Fargo is the mortgage banking. Obviously, they had a great 2012. They originated over $500 billion in mortgages, so that's mortgages and, let's and just, refi. So let's just be clear that when you say that the income from mortgage banking, you mean when they originate a mortgage and then sell it off to a third party and, and collect the uh, fee in between for doing that. Exactly. And when we say mortgage, that includes first home purchases and refinance. So the bulk of this has been refinancing volume. And we've seen rates move up in the first and mostly the second quarter of this year. So that refinancing is slowing a little bit. So that's where the concern comes in. And it's already started. In the first quarter, Wells Fargo reported their mortgage banking, that, that fee income that you were talking about was down 9%. Mm -hmm. So th the expectation is that that will continue to be down. I'm not too concerned about it. I, I would more be concerned, where are they gonna pivot? I, I mean, they can sit there and shrug their shoulders and say, oh well, we're not going to make as much money, or they can be proactive about it and they can put their efforts to another part of the business. So I'd, I'm not necessarily worried about that falling that much. I'm more interested in seeing where are they going to put their energy now. Okay. Well, one of the big things that I'm going to be watching with all of the banks in, the, in this earnings season is it's called other comprehensive income. And basically this, this Sounds tracks, boring. It, it's, <laughs> it, it does sound boring. It's, it's going to be very important this quarter though. This essentially tracks the, the, the changes to the company's financial position that don't show up on the income statement. And one of the, one of the big things that doesn't show up on the income statement is unrealized gains or losses. So a, as individual investors, we might uh, own a stock in our portfolio. So over the course of a quarter, over the course of a year, the value of that stock will change. But if we don't sell that stock, then it remains an unrealized gain or loss depending on, on how it moved. Mm -hmm. So if you think about a bank and all of the securities that it holds on its portfolio, the you know, debt securities, equity securities, these, these change in price over time. And unless the bank sells them, it's an unrealized gain or loss. And eventually, that'll probably become realized on most of these. So it's an interesting thing to watch. The other real, big important reason that this is, this is notable to watch is we value bank stocks based on book value. And changes to other comprehensive income, changes to these unrealized gains and losses hit book value. So if book value falls as a result of this, it reduces the value of the stock. Mm -hmm. And now the reason, the, the reason that in this quarter in particular this is going to be important is because the, the, rise, the rise of the interest rates reduces the value of fixed income securities. In the bond market, higher interest rates lead to lower prices. So we saw a big jump in interest rates in this past quarter. So that's going to hit the balance sheet hard. That's going to hit the debt securities on banks' balance sheets pretty hard. Mm -hmm. The last time we saw something kind of comparable to this was in the second quarter of 2004. And pretty much across the board, we saw big losses at the banks. And Bank of America, Citigroup, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo all saw losses on their debt securities. Interestingly, I will note that Citigroup saw on a percentage basis uh, the lowest loss of, of mm -hmm. the four banks. So when we come around to this quarter, that's something I'm definitely going to be watching. I, you know, I think on a rough, roughly calculated basis, we could be seeing um, unrealized losses in the four to five billion dollar range for for the bigger banks for JP at, at each bank, bank of America or, or total. For, no, 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 for each one. Mm -hmm. uh, th these are these are very rough numbers, um, and, and certainly when you look at it as a percentage of book value, I mean we're talking two percent, two and a half percent kind of thing on, on the basis of book value. Mm -hmm. um, but these losses could be could be relatively steep. Right, and you, you mentioned that these are rough numbers. We also have to factor in that these banks can have hedges 
out there to mitigate some of these losses. So that's another factor. They might have unrealized losses in that securities portfolio, but it may be offset in hedges. So that's another thing investors want to watch for. Right. And, and the other thing that we want to keep in mind when we're looking at this is although we'll be seeing these losses in this quarter, bigger picture, the higher interest rates are better for the banks. Mm -hmm. and, and in particular, because the movement that we saw over the past quarter steepened the yield curve. Here we go into, into some more jargon here. Mm -hmm. So basically what happens is the, the yield curve measures the, the difference between the, the long dated fixed income and the short dated fixed income. And without getting into too much detail, when it steepens, it's better for banks because they get more income on the longer dated securities that they tend to hold and they pay less on the shorter uh, fixed income mm -hmm. securities that they tend to use as borrowing rates. Right. So, so when the, the yield, curve steep, yield curve steepens as it has in the past quarter, that's a good thing for the, for the interest rate spread that these banks collect. Now this sounds like it's a, an industry-wide concern or, or issue coming in. Is there anything that you're watching specifically? I know you're a, a Bank of America shareholder. Is this the main thing that you're watching at Bank of America? Or is there something else that, that you kind of have your eye on? No, it's, it's not the main thing at Bank of America in particular. I mean, that's such a, it's kind of an idiosyncratic situation there. One of the things that I'd really like to see at Bank of America, I I'm not expecting that I will see it, I'd love to see uh, Moynihan and management kind of step out of, of, the, of the canned responses mm -hmm. and, and, and address the, the issues that Bank of America has been seeing, address some of the you know, concerns over the way the bank has treated customers or allegedly treated customers in the past. Uh, you know, level with us. Mm -hmm. Let us know what's going on. Let us know what changes have been made because a lot of a lot of the things that have been hitting the news wires lately are issues that that are that took place back in around 2010. And Moynihan took over as CEO in 2010, so he could get out there right now and say, "Hey, look, this may have happened." Obviously, he doesn't want mm -hmm. to step on his lawyer's toes and say that it did, but but he said. Maybe maybe we had some bad controls on, on how employees were handling their business units back in 2010. We've made big changes since then, and we're really excited about the ways that we can better treat customers now, help customers better than ever, and and hopefully you know these were isolated situations that he's now addressed. So I'm I'm not. I'm not expecting that I'll hear that, but that's what I would really love to hear. From yeah, I agree with quarter. you. I think you and I both agree that these issues, these side issues that, that get headlines, that get media attention, I don't think those are going to be the true driver of the stock over the next five, ten years, mm -hmm. but it would be nice for him to come out and be a little bit more candid. I mean, you talk about Jamie Dimon, people have their issues with him, but he is a very candid CEO. He'll address issues straight on. Moynihan's a little bit more robotic in terms of his responses, so it would be nice to see him just to, just to appease uh, uh, some of the shareholders that, that do want answers to those questions. Sure. So stay, now staying in the, in the financial realm, but moving over to insurance companies, this is going to be a, a very similar, a, a similar story in terms of what I'll be watching here. Again, it's that OCI, it's the, the, these, uh, the investments that the insurance companies hold on their, hold on their books. So as a brief review, insurance companies uh, take premiums and they hold the premiums that, that we pay them, that, that everybody pays them. They hold those on their balance sheet until they have to pay them out. And in the meantime, they can invest that in a variety of different things. Usually they do it in high quality fixed income securities because they're very liquid and they can sell them and pay off the claims when, mm -hmm. people, when people give their claims to the insurance companies. The downside this quarter is that, again, this is all fixed income. So with rising rates, those fixed income portfolios are going to see some weakness on price, and we're, we're most likely going to see some fairly sizable losses from the major insurance companies. Uh, again, in terms of comparable periods, looking back to that 2004, uh, second quarter of 2004, I went back and I looked at Travelers and at Allstate. And, uh, and at Warren Buffett's uh, Berkshire Hathaway mm -hmm. and looked at the losses that they saw. And for, for travelers, it was kind of in the $1 billion range. This is on the unrealized losses again. Allstate, about $2 billion. Allstate had a, a much more sizable portfolio than travelers at the time. Berkshire Hathaway, maybe this doesn't surprise people, but the, the smallest loss of the group, mm -hmm. 770, $777 million change in unrealized gains back in second quarter of 2004. And a big part of the reason there is that Berkshire's portfolio, uh, where, where it's holding that uh, that claim money, that potential claim money, is in a much broader mix of debt and equity securities. So when you see interest rates rise, you don't see quite as much of an you don't necessarily see as much mm -hmm. of an impact from the equity as you do from the debt. 
So when it comes to the insurance companies, that's a big storyline that I'll be watching. I'll be looking for just how much weakness they saw on their balance sheets. The other thing is, is that the insurance business, the insurance industry is a cyclical one. And it's, it's, uh, there are times where insurance rates, what they call harden, which basically mm -hmm. means that uh, insurance companies can price their insurance coverage a little bit better so that they can be more profitable in their coverage. And then at times the, the market softens and they don't get as good, good of pricing. And a lot of companies, the smart companies, the smart insurance companies like Berkshire Hathaway, they actually back away from the market. And they'll, mm -hmm. they'll look for, they'll accept lower amounts of premiums in order to not have to take poor pricing. Yeah, and I hear what you're saying in terms of, those are the two things that you're watching. The first thing in terms of their book values falling, in my opinion, that is a short-term headwind. We talk about book values, it, it's, it might take a hit, and that's, it might happen. But in the long run, I think the second part of what you're talking about is the more important, the actual business. Do they still have underwriting discipline? Are, how are they pricing risk in the marketplace? I think that's the thing that long-term investors want to pay attention to more so than did book value decrease just this one quarter. I think when you're in evaluating insurance company, if you want to buy that stock, it's still going to be, what's their track record mm -hmm. of underwriting? What's their track record of investment philosophy. Sure. And I think that's going to be the main driver rather than just a quarter hit to book value. Right. I, that's, that's a great point. That said, zooming back in on this particular quarter, if there is any particular insurance company, any individual insurance company that sees losses that are outsized or, or far less mm -hmm. than everybody else that is sort of away from the pack, because broadly speaking, we're going to see similar types of declines from the entire pack because they're all playing in the same market. So if anybody stands out from that pack, either from a, from, a, from a good perspective or a bad perspective, that'll be worth watching. And one more insurance company that I, that I should throw in here that I will be definitely watching this uh, earnings season is AIG as mm -hmm. well. On there, I'm not really worried about the, uh, the balance sheet as much as everybody else because, again, like, like Bank of America that we were just talking about before, this is a very particular situation. And with AIG, uh, it's not the environment that I'm concerned with as much as the company itself, the company in particular, and the results that it's getting from its uh, property and casual, casualty insurance mm -hmm. and from its life insurance. These are its core businesses. Robert Ben Moshe, his, his big rallying cry is we're going to refocus on the core businesses. So as an investor myself, I'm going to be looking at, are you delivering on that promise? Absolutely. Now, Moving over to another group that relies very heavily on balance sheet, the mortgage REITs. Right. It's been, it's been a rough year so far for mortgage REIT investors. Do you have any good news for this quarter? <laughs> you said it's a rough year and that's been absolutely true. But let's zoom out a little bit and look at the last five years. The last five years have been great for mortgage REITs. So if we look at three- Historically great. If we say. look at three reasons about why they were so great, these glory days, of mortgage rates. The first one would be short-term rates went down very quickly at, in the onset of the recession. So when these funding rates dropped precipitously, they were paying less on their borrowings and they were still collecting on those higher mortgage-backed securities that they had from when rates were higher. Yep. So those two coupled together, they had a widening net interest margin. And then the third thing is prepayment speed. A lot of borrow borrowers could not refinance because their housing prices dropped. So in 2012, we saw housing prices come back, refinancing picked up. So that started to, to creep into these stock so prices. Let's, let's, let's rewind a little bit there. Prepayment speed, of course, it, it's, it's, the, it's the speed at which people are prepaying their mm -hmm. mortgages. And, and for a mortgage REIT like Annaly Capital or, or American Capital Agency, those are actually two really good examples because they focus primarily on agency mortgage-backed securities. Mm -hmm. And because they're backed by agencies, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac primarily, you don't have the same default risk right. that you have with non-agency mortgage-backed securities. But you still have this pre prepayment risk, and that's a big issue. So as people repay their mortgages, those mortgage-backed securities lose those income streams, and that makes the mortgage-backed security worth less. Mm -hmm. So higher prepayment speeds, lower valuations on the mortgage-backed securities, l lower worth on the mortgage-backed securities. As prepayment speeds fall, those mortgage-backed securities become worth more because the, uh, the mortgages within them stick mm -hmm. around longer. So you were saying that, that prepayment speeds were art sort of artificially- Relative, Relatively low yeah. considering how low interest rates were at the time. So the last five years were great for a company like AGNC. I think the returns were up, total returns were up 400% 
in at the end of that's, 2012. That's not bad. At, at now now it's back down to in two two sixty I think two hundred sixty percent. So still a, a very good outperformer, but. Sure. The time is shifting now a little bit. Now there's two main worries about the mortgage rates going forward. So net interest margin, that difference between what they pay on their borrowings and what they collect on their portfolio has been shrinking. That's obviously a concern. Again, rising interest rates, OCI, the hit to book value when interest rates go up, the value on their portfolio of those mortgage-backed securities will go down. And when we talk about these, these institutions that are, that are levered and they're basically all fixed income, mm -hmm. these can be very big hits to book value. So that's going to be the very, very number one concern and it, with these mortgage rates. Well, with the, with the losses so far this year, I, I was looking at it, I think it was yesterday, and it, if, if I remember correctly, uh, American Capital Agency was trading at about 0.8 times, so at a 20% discount to its book value. Do you think at this point, I mean, I have to assume that this is investors expecting mm -hmm. this hit to book value that's going that, that, that's come through the, through the higher interest rates and lower valuations on the fixed income securities. Do you think a lot of this weakness is already priced into these stocks? I think it, I think it definitely is. There still is uncertainty, though, because th the market obviously looks at these companies and says, yes, there's going to be hits to book value. The other part of the equation is, how did the management team navigate that environment? I think that's the part that's still leaning out there, what still could knock these down further. If it comes out and it's, and it's larger loss than expected, mm -hmm. they didn't hedge it at all, then I think there's still a lot more downside to some of these companies. So I know you're not necessarily a huge fan of the mortgage rates in terms of having them in your own portfolio. If I put your feet to the fire, thinking about the current uh, environment that we're in right now, which one are you buying? Gonna go a little bit boring. You'd have to go with Annaly Capital just because they're they're the biggest player in the space. They've been in the space for such a long time. I think they're the kind of the industry experts. They've seen interest rate fluctuations before. This isn't. I mentioned AGNC. This is a company that has just ballooned in mm -hmm. size the last couple of years. They they started growing during these during these great times, as I mentioned. Where usually you look at an Annaly, they've been through a changing interest rate environment. They've have a little bit more experience navigating this type of thing. So if I had to buy one, put it away in a drawer, hold it for five years, I'd be much more comfortable holding Annaly than a than an AGNC or an Armor Residential. Going with the going with the longevity and experience. Exactly. I, I like that call. So finishing out here, let's sort of rewind back to what we started with, and and revisit this concept of other comprehensive income OCI. What in the world? is OCI. What, what is it in plain terms, and, and why, why do investors really need to be watching this? I think you mentioned it earlier. It's just like any investor out there that, that owns a stock. If you pull up your brokerage account and you still hold it, you haven't sold it, mm -hmm. they'll give you a column there that says unrealized gain, unrealized loss. Mm -hmm. So like you said, you haven't realized that gain in terms of your, your net income for the year, if, you, if you're calculating your income at the end of the year. But the value of that security has changed. And a lot of these institutions like banks, insurance companies, mortgage REITs, they mark a lot of their portfolio to market. Mm -hmm. So not every company has to go in and mark all their assets after, at the end of every quarter based on how they've changed. But these institutions are marked to market, meaning they mark their assets to what the market is pricing those at the time. So at the end of the quarter, they go in and assess how is this change based on the market, and they recognize the unrealized loss or gain on that portfolio. Sure. And and when we when we think about using this practically, so let's say that I'm an investor in in JP Morgan, for mm -hmm. instance, and I, I look ahead to this quarter and JP Morgan is gonna make X billion dollars, let's say three billion dollars in, in that range. Mm -hmm. I'm just I'm pulling that number out of thin air by the way. Let's say JP Morgan is gonna make three billion dollars uh, on its on its bottom line, its net income mm -hmm. for the quarter. And so typically what would happen is that that $3 billion would be added to shareholder equity. Mm -hmm. And when we think about valuing a bank stock like JP Morgan, we're going to value it as a multiple of shareholders' equity. Mm -hmm. So if shareholder equity, if, if the multiple stays the same, let's say we're valuing it at 1x book, and I think that's actually where JP Morgan mm -hmm. roughly is trading right now. If we value it at 1x book, we add $3 billion more to that shareholder equity, then all of a sudden the stock is worth more. Right. So that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. 
but this other comprehensive income gets added to or netted out from net income. So if you have $3 billion in net income, and let's say just for sake of throwing out numbers, you have a $3 billion other comprehensive loss, that wipes out your net income there. That wipes out what's going to be added to shareholder equity. So from quarter to quarter, your shareholder equity is flat, and the, the potential for stock gains, the potential for it to climb based on that uh, shareholder equity or the book value advance is gone. Mm -hmm. So this is a really important thing to watch in general, but I think, again, this quarter with, with the big changes in interest rates that we've seen, it'll be particularly important to watch. Yeah, and I think the simplest way to think about it is, yes, it's under that net income line, but if we just think about the balance sheet, if your asset declines in value, there has to be an offset on the other side of the balance sheet, and that's where the offset in shareholders' equity comes in. Great, good way to put it. Thanks for watching, folks. Have a great fourth, and we'll see you soon.